morning, everyone. I'd like to start with a welcome by our councilman, David Ruth. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Council District 4 in the Ebel Theater. And this is an amazing crowd. I was shocked. When I came this morning, I thought I was at the wrong event because I saw so many people here. Um, you know, it's such a pleasure for me to be here and give welcome. Um, I'm told I'm supposed to give welcome to this program as well to kick it off, as well as introduce my good friend, Assembly Member Richard Bloom, all in 60 seconds, which is super difficult because homelessness is an issue that is near and dear to my heart. Um, but you know, first let me just thank uh, uh, Jill, Jill Wellman, who's gonna be moderating all of our panelists. You have an amazing panel. You got Phil Ansel, Alyssa Arduna, um, Kelly Morrison, Tommy Newman, and uh, Veronica Arte. Gary, instead of Tommy. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, 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 we got the big boss. <laughs> And, uh, and Veronica Ortega for being here. Um, and you have such a diverse mix of panelists. And of course, I really want to thank Julie Stromberg um, uh, for, for helping with the program, and of course, the Ebel and, and, and the entire Ebel board for hosting this event. But like I said, this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart, and we have come such a long way. Uh, I think it's no question that homelessness is the issue of the decade. And yes, while it's frustrating and while it looks like nothing's being done, I have to tell you, um, having worked uh, previous to running for office, I worked for a acute psychiatric mental health hospital in South Los Angeles. We were the largest homeless outreach provider for them for six years. And before that, I worked for LA County on homeless services for six years under supervisory Long work. Trust me when I say this, about 15 years ago, it was like the situation was even so was even worse where the city sued the county, and I'm sure the panelists will tell you all about that, how it evolved and came here today. It went from the city suing the county to now the city, the county, the state, and the federal government, all working hand in hand to solve this problem. So you're going to hear all about it from the panelists, but you know, I just want to introduce my good friend, my, our partner in the state, because like I said, your participation here and your interest is so important. Because when you see the homeless out on the street, when you see them on the overpass, and you're saying, why is no one doing anything? People are doing a lot. It is that frustrating, it is that part of an issue, and it's because of champions like Assembly Member Richard Bloom up in the state, fighting the fight on his end to provide, to change the laws, whether it's greatly disabled or whether it's more funding or, or, or changing restrictions so that local governments, cities and counties, in partnership with the community-based organizations and the community, actually deliver these services. So it's such great to have friends like Richard Bloom. Uh, we represent the same areas. He represents one of the hard-hit areas from, uh, from the beach cities all the way to uh, uh, Hollywood. Uh, we both um, are champions for the LGBT Center. Um, and without his help, it will be the LGBT Center, which will be providing 200 new um, beds and 200 new residences for seniors and transitional age youth will not be built. So I really want to thank my uh, partner um, in this effort and introduce Assembly Member Richard Blue. Yeah. Thank you, Council Member Blue. Uh, David, uh, thank you for taking on this issue of, of homelessness. It is probably one of the most long-standing and frustrating issues that we face here in, in California. And we need every one of you to be champions on this issue and to be speaking up with a, a loud voice. And I know that you do in your own way. I want to encourage you on that. My own personal journey on the issue of homelessness back in the mid-90s, uh, when I was first running for elective office, it was uh, one of two uh, races that I lost, David uh, uh, may, may have left, he didn't lose a race, he won his first race. I had to lose twice before I finally won in 1999, but it, it was either 1996 or 1998, uh, I've told this story multiple times, so I apologize if you heard it before, but I was uh, in Santa Monica at an election forum, 
and the question about homelessness came up. And at that time, I was uh, a novice on the issue. I knew very little. I was just a resident of the city of Santa Monica, then uh, as now a progressive city where uh, you would expect people to be rallying uh, on this issue. And the question was asked, you know, what are you going to do about homelessness? And I began my remarks by talking about how the homeless were uh, uh, brothers and sisters and family members and friends and you know, anyone could call them homeless. In Santa Monica, people started jeering me. Uh, that was a wake-up call for me. Um, it made me want to understand more about this issue and, uh, and begin to work on it. And, and I did in 1999 when I was finally elected after those two very frustrating elections. Uh, I was fortunate enough, uh, 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 I think it was around 2002, uh, then assembly member Gil Cedillo arranged a, a trip uh, along with Ed Edelman, who was the homeless czar in, uh, in Santa Monica, who we, we had appointed. Uh, we went to New York and we looked at the programs that existed in New York, and that really began uh, a, what we uh, called, uh, uh, partly under my leadership on the Santa Monica City Council, uh, a new paradigm in Santa Monica where we started looking at permanent supportive housing as opposed to shelter care as a long-term solution. Uh, I began uh, locally in Santa Monica to talk about how this issue was not Santa Monica's issue. It was an issue that belonged to all of us and tried to uh, focus people on more regional solutions as opposed to previously where folks have been saying, well, there's uh, 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 beds in Santa Monica uh, if you were in Beverly Hills, for example, um, here's a, uh, a bus token, go out to Santa Monica and they'll take care of you. We need to think about this on a much larger scale because the issue is larger scale. I was appointed to two 10-year uh, plan uh, uh, boards, uh, a very, very frustrating experience. First, the, uh, uh, for sure the, the first one. Uh, these are both plans that are sitting around on a shelf somewhere. I uh, don't want to say they didn't do any good, but uh, you see the results today. This is, is growing. Okay. Uh, I was hired by uh, Joel Roberts from PATH uh, uh, to be one of his uh, underlings. Uh, Joel uh, kept me on board, uh, but unfortunately our timing was very poor. I started uh, just as the economy, I started in the, uh, uh, literally the month before the economy crashed uh, back in, the, in the 2008. Uh, and in 2009, the funding for my position had been gone, so Joel and I uh, and Path uh, were forced to uh, 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 our company at that time. But I learned again, uh, even more uh, about the issue. This is one of the most frustrating issues that we face. And after so many years of working on the issue, you can imagine how despondent um, I felt, and I think along with all of you, when the most recent uh, uh, numbers came out after uh, uh, the comps took place uh, not that many months ago, where uh, roughly 25%, or excuse me, roughly 25% increase, countywide, uh, almost the same number in the city of Santa Monica's account. Uh, in parts of Northern California, the counts are even higher. Uh, we have so much more work to do on this issue. And there's a credit to each and every one of you that you're here, intent on hearing the latest information and the latest thinking. It's, it isn't as if nothing is happening, but to some degree, um, our actions are at cross purposes with the reality that we face on, uh, on the housing issue. I'll, I'll get to that in, in a moment, but I think you're all familiar with most of these statistics, so I'm not going to bore you with talking about the number of homeless individuals. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, California, uh, we're uh, known for our unmatched beauty, for our extraordinary natural resources, for our great weather. Right now, but um, uh, especially uh, 
out on the field at Dodger Stadium yesterday. I'm glad I wasn't, but it was 101 uh, when I looked on the on the uh, weather app yesterday. It was 101 at Dodger Stadium and 101 in Santa Monica. I told you that there's, there's something wrong with the planet. Uh, California known for its uh, uh, its great diversity and for championing our our diversity, for being economic one of the economic engines for the world, the sixth largest economy in the world, and yet crushing poverty and homelessness that is a shameful mark upon us that has existed for so many decades now. Back in the, in the 90s and, and, and in years subsequent, we used to uh, blame Ronald Reagan for uh, closing uh, mental health institutions and you know, being one of the reasons that so many mentally ill homeless individuals were on the streets. And that was certainly true at the time, but you know, we can't blame Reagan anymore. This is our problem, and you know, I'm happy to blame Reagan. We have other people that we can blame for things today. Um, you know, we, we really need to own this issue, and we need to be the solution to the problem. I, I, I mentioned that I wanted to talk for a moment about housing, uh, but before I do that, I, 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 don't, I don't want to you know, just be a, a, a negative person here. There is a lot, as you know, because I know you all work on HHH and, and Measure H, and, encouraged to the, uh, and, and lobby for the efforts that have taken place in Sacramento. All of these things are conspiring to help the issue that we are going to see change. Uh, but one of the things that I focused on in Sacramento, one of my uh, major issues, is the uh, unprecedented housing crisis, housing affordability crisis that the state of California is facing. And nowhere is it more present than in San Francisco uh, in our urban areas, but right here in Los Angeles County. Uh, it, it is something that we have allowed to fester and grow for many years, and we're really just now coming to terms with it. There's so much more work to do, but I'm very proud of having carried a number of housing bills. Uh, I think I weighed in 14 bills at the, at the beginning of the session. Uh, many of them were passed as, or two, or two of them were passed as part of the housing package that uh, uh, Governor Brown signed just a few weeks ago. Uh, but I've always felt that there's an intersection between the housing affordability crisis and the rise in homelessness that we're seeing. And we're not going to be able to get uh, a handle on the issue of homelessness uh, until we're doing a much, much better job on housing. Uh, there hasn't been much evidence uh, 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 for that uh, up until now. Now the uh, actual um, uh, research is being done, uh, and uh, we happened to, uh, yesterday in Sacramento, had a, uh, a hearing on housing under the leadership of uh, David Chu of uh, San Francisco, who was just an extraordinary champion on, this, on, on the issue of uh, housing. And uh, Miriam Zook, who is a professor at Berkeley, um, uh, has just done a research brief. She was one of the panelists. And uh, 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 she's done uh, research in San Mateo County. And one, uh, the, her, her primary focus is on displacement issues in general. One in three displaced households in San Mateo County, one in three, have reported some period of homelessness or marginal housing. So the actual evidence is beginning to emerge about this tie. So it is important that we begin to build more market rate housing. It is extremely important that we build more uh, deep restrictive affordable housing. Uh, very uh, proud to have been part of that uh, movement forward by the passage of my bill that uh, fixes once and for all the confusion over whether or not cities can have enforceable uh, uh, inclusionary housing policies, the so-called Palmer Fix, so that was signed by the governor, and now 160 jurisdictions throughout the state of California that have these ordinances are going to be able to uh, move forward and enforce them, and we believe that more jurisdictions are going to have 
uh, inclusionary housing ordinances that will result in more housing. I could go on and on on this issue, uh, but we have a great panel of speakers here who are going to do just that and do it much more eloquently than me. So let me thank you once again for the hard work that you are doing, that you have done, and that you will continue to do in the future. Stay engaged, stay involved. We are going to make a difference. And we are going to make a difference. Thank you, Assemblyman Bloom. Welcome, everyone. Uh, many of you may not be that familiar with the EVO. The EVO was uh, founded in 1894 by women for women when women couldn't vote or be educated. Think about that. Well, our purpose here is to empower women, our members, and the community in issues of today. And today represents one of those issues, homelessness. It's, it's so big, and we know so little, and we're, we often feel powerless to do anything. So our goal today is to help you learn more and feel like you can do something or support someone in your in your life and not feel that dread as you drive by a person with a sign. So, here's a fun part. We're live on Facebook. So, if any of you have friends or want to share what happens today with your friends, you, it will be archived and you can share it after the event. I love that Evo is getting hit with technology too, so it's awesome. Um, before we go any further, I want to, there's a couple of people to thank the fact that all of you are here. Uh, one is our president of the EVO, Lois Braun, who gave us the green light to do this wonderful project. Thank you, Lois. Uh, my amazing co-chair, Rebecca Hutchinson. Our committee, excuse me, which includes Patty Lombard, Patty Carroll, Julie Stromberg, Jane Gilman, Lori Schechter, and Evelyn Tovlier, if I said that right. The EVO staff, Meredith Dighton, Tina Tanga Lattice, Julie Soto, Gus McClare, and Andy uh, Robino. Robino. I um, also like to thank the Imaginally staff, Diana Salazar, who's going to be our timekeeper today, Sierra Thornton, and Andy Thornton. Um, our sponsors today are City National Bank, United Way, Councilman Rue, thank you. And he's off to do his work, so he is not joining us. So I was wonderful when he came. The Greater Wilshire Neighborhood Council, which I encourage you all to get involved with, and we have a wonderful a number of representatives here today, but one uh, who is an incredible advocate for homelessness, Joe Hoffman. Uh, Imagine LA, Next LA, uh, which is the new junior LA chamber. Larchmont Buzz, and St. Anne's. A few logistics. Um, we've got five panelists. Four are Native, Ameri Native Americans. Oh my God, I can't believe I said that. <laughs> well, 
are native Californians and native Los Angelinos. And the only one that isn't a native has been here for 40 years. So these are people that care about your city, our city, our county. And I'm really, it was wonderful to find out about that. Grace, I'm going to start with Greg. Greg is the Director of Strategic Initiatives at uh, the uh, Inner City Law Center. I mean, Greg has spent 20 plus years advocating on, on behalf of homelessness and poverty and how to end it, um, as well as creating policy. He recently, he was the first policy director for Mayor Garcetti, and really uh, will never claim this, but people say he is much the architect behind the positive, progressive policy that we have happening today in Los Angeles. Phil Ansel is the director of the Los Angeles County Homeless Initiative. Phil is a quintessential public servant. He has Sent, but of the best, best variety. He has, um, he spent 11, 19 years at the Department of uh, uh, Social Services. There's so many, I'm really trying not to use acronyms tonight and no buzzwords or today, so um, I'm going to try to stick with that. Phil's special power is collaboration. He helped get so many nonprofits, so many public citizens, so many branches and aspects of government, of government together to create the homeless initiative and strategy. It was mind boggling. At one point, he had 50 people in a room hurting and getting them, and they actually made a decision and went forward. Can you believe that? <laughs> Kelly, Carrie Morrison wears about 20 hats, in, and I, that's probably an understatement in the world of homelessness. She, uh, as she represents property owners in uh, Hollywood, and, and she's created Hollywood Forward, which is a, an organization to end homelessness in Hollywood. She's been the chair of the Los Angeles Homeless Service Authority. She's on the HHH Oversight Committee. I mean, I can, you get it? Lots, lots of hands. <coughs> so, um, and she's an absolute authority on housing. Terrific to have her here. Uh, Veronica is an implementer. This is a woman who is absolutely passionate about helping people get through trauma. Get through trauma. And one of the major ways to help people get through trauma when they've been homeless is to give them housing. And she's going to tell us today about a project um, where she's doing just that. Um, and last but not least is me. Uh, my name is Jill Bowden. I'm the president and uh, founder of Imagine LA, CEO, and uh, I kind of got this group together. And uh, uh, Imagine LA has a mentorship program that works with homeless families and Lisa. Lisa! Oh my God! <laughs> not last but not least. Lisa's amazing. Okay, her. She's even wearing red. Okay. <laughs> Um, Lisa is the homeless policy director uh, at the mayor. She followed in Greg's footsteps and has talked about an implementer. She's an implementer. She's making it happen. She's out there every day. And she is passionate, like I am, about community engagement. This makes her happy. And without further ado, Greg. It's going to start us off with, with Homelessness 101. So get out your pencils and let's go. Hi, um, thanks for being here today. So I'm going to give the who, what, where, why on homelessness. I'm going to give you way too many statistics. It's my job to bore you with statistics. So thank you, some of you for not taking my job. I won't be doing that. But first, before I get into statistics and we talk about generalities, I want to remind us that um, a homeless person on the street each one has a unique story which um, that takes them to that place and it's always surprising and unpredictable and they're all unique and so I want us to remember that um, and because to get people off the street it's going to take a unique tailored approach to each of them. So 
I'm going to go into stats and we're going to make generalizations, but everybody really is different, and that's what we know from working with them. So I'm going to say that and then throw that all away and give you more some statistics. Um, so 58,000 we talked about, 58,000 people homeless in LA County on any given night. We know that number because every year we do a homeless count where six, 7,000 volunteers coordinated by the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority have clipboards and they go out in LA County, we count as old in LA County, we count people. Um, we count cars, we count tents, we count people. So that's where the number comes from. It's not an exact science, but it's the best number we have. We get better at it each year, but that's, that's what we know. We also know that it's about 11,000 people higher than last year. Um, it's not the highest count we've ever had. That was 2005. So the methodologies are changing over time. This is probably the most accurate we've ever been. And again, this is on any one given night. This counting goes on in January. Over the course of the year, many more people are homeless. Probably three times as many are homeless in LA County um, over the course of the year. But on any given night, we think about 58,000. Um, okay, so who are the people who are out there? About one in three are female, two in three male. Um, from the last count, 484 people were transgender and 160 who don't identify um, male, female, or transgender. About one in seven of our homeless people are homeless as families. Kids, parents, they're a homeless family, one in seven. So, you know, we're talking about a lot of people. Youth, um, about one in 11 of our homeless people are less than 24 years old. And tragically, um, there are children who are homeless, not with their families, but alone. 284 people in the count are less than 17 year old, years old and on their own. Um, race and ethnicity, uh, about 20% of our homeless people are white, 35% are Latino, and 40% are African American, uh, which is disproportionate. The African American on the, pop on the population of the city at large is about 9%. Uh, African American, so it's way disproportionate, which reflects on some of the ways people become homeless, um, access to housing, jobs, criminal backgrounds, all things that um, we have a history of targeting African Americans for and people of color create you're more likely to be homeless and we see that in statistics. Um, about 1% are Asian, 1% are American Indian, and a little less than 1% are Pacific Islanders. Um, some health demographics, we all have um, uh, conclusions we think we know about who the homeless people are. So let me give you a little bit of what the demographics show. About one in three have a serious mental illness. It's not everybody, it's one in three. About one in five have a substance abuse disorder. Often those are co-occurring, people self-medicating. Um, so people with mental illness often also have um, uh, substance abuse issues, but not necessarily. About one in five have a physical disability. And about one in three have experience with domestic violence. And one in two of our women on the street have experience with domestic violence. And we have about 5,000 veterans who are homeless in LA County, which um, is a 50% increase over last year. Um, three in four are unsheltered, meaning they're not in a shelter at night. They're someplace where people aren't intended to sleep. Um, and of those, 11,000 are in vehicles, and 3,000 are in encampments. So that's 14,000 of visible homeless. That probably is consistent with what you're experiencing. It's more visible on the street. Um, that number has tripled since 2013. So um, it was less, it's about 4,000 in 2013, now about 14,000 in vehicles. Um, where are people uh, ge geographically in the county? Well, we know they're everywhere. And people who are homeless tend to uh, become homeless. They stay near where they were housed. Think about yourself, where would you go if you became homeless? I would want to know in a community I know, with people I know where I could get help. That's what homeless people tend to do, just like us. They lose their housing, they tend to stay close to home. There's concentrations in South LA, downtown. Skid Row has about 4,000 homeless people. That's a nice concentration. But the west side in Venice, they're uh, everywhere, um, as Angelina was right aware. And we have a notion that um, people are coming to LA to be homeless from warmer, uh, to come to warmer climates, that's simply not true. Two-thirds of our homeless people have been in LA County for more than 10 years. This is a local problem, this is an Angelino problem. Um, homeless people in Los Angeles are our neighbors. Wonderful. Um, I'd like to um, uh, ask the other panelists if they would like to make any comments about um, our homeless population. 
led to uh, make one point. That Greg mentioned that there's a significant minority of the homeless population who suffer from mental illness and or substance abuse. But that means that a significant majority suffer from neither. Um, what we see in the data from 2017 is that the growth in the homeless population appears to be primarily due to economic factors. People who are unable to pay the rent, it's that simple, unable to pay the rent and therefore uh, become homeless. So if you think about solutions, uh, focusing on that population as well as the substantial minority of the homeless population who do suffer from mental illness and substance abuse is very important. And that ties back to something in Bloom's comment about the critical impact of the shortage of affordable housing, which results in rising rents, which results in homelessness. The yeah, one thing I would say, uh, to be a bit of a contrarian, and I've argued with Loss about this, I feel in Hollywood, we have a greater percentage of people who come from out of the area or out of state. We've done our own little simple non-scientific survey um, a couple years ago. We just asked people, where were you a year ago? And we found that 44% of the people we talked to had been out of state. So somehow they come to Hollywood because they think something better awaits them here. I don't think they go to Coima or Silmar or Torrance. They come to Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's right. In some places that um, people that migrate here and can't find housing are more likely to go. That is part of cannot go to school. Um, someone asked a question about um, what programs or organizations are in place to help homeless with their pets. Um, Inner City Law Center has uh, a nonprofit that um, is at our location downtown every Wednesday. It's called Downtown Dog Rescue. And um, they work with people who are homeless or just really poor people who need help and then they have food and shots and they get the license and things like that. So Downtown Dog Rescue is an excellent organization. There's also five shelters that um, have received funding from LASA using funding from the county that uh, are in the process of making modifications to be pet friendly, such as adding special rooms or kennels or dog rooms. Uh, here's a question from the panelists. Can someone answer? Can you speak about people living in cars and the health and sanitary conditions surrounding disposal of um, urine, uh, just regular hygiene, um, uh, you know, mobile showers, and um, you know, just overall uh, health for people living in cars. I was going to include that in my remarks, but I can answer that now. Um, okay. We recognize the unsanitary conditions, and part of the street engagement strategy is increasing the number of what we call safe parking lots. These are really working in partnership with faith-based communities that open up their parking lots, bring in bathrooms, bring in showers, bring in meals to really help people that are car dwellers. As well as working with our recreation and parks, we're also launching something called a hygiene station in the Skid Row community, which I'm sure many of you have driven around and seen the film uh, sets where they have the toilet trailers and the shower trailers. We're trying to replicate that model in Skid Row and in other communities. Uh, no, we're not taking, uh, you can write a question now. Um, thank you for all your questions that you are that you are submitting. Given the different topics of the panelists, um, I'll, I'll do my best to make sure your question is answered at the most appropriate time. So do not think that we've not answered it, that we're not going. Any other uh, remarks on just uh, panelists on our homeless population and anything that you might want to add to the conversation? Um, great alluded to it, but it's a population that's kind of silently growing, and that's the number of women that are experiencing homelessness, and in particular, senior women. So women nowadays, over the age of 55, are falling into homelessness, either rising housing costs, um, loss of pension during the Great Recession, and just inability to have that kind of savings. So that's a population we're particularly concerned about. Right on time. Okay. Now I'd like to turn the, um, the microphone to Phil Ansel, who's going to really talk about the strategy, the unprecedented strategy in the county and 
and city that is happening now. Thank you, good morning. Uh, I'm going to talk about the substance uh, briefly. Uh, the extraordinary plan we have in Los Angeles County to prevent and combat homelessness. And then I want to say uh, a little bit about the collaboration that Jill referenced in her introductions that is at the heart of this plan, both its development and implementation and evolution. So the plan that we have in Los Angeles County was adopted by the Board of Supervisors on February 9, 2016. And on that very same day, uncoincidentally, the city of Los Angeles adopted the first ever comprehensive Los Angeles City uh, homeless strategy. That's very important because, as was mentioned earlier, the, his the historic relationship between the city of Los Angeles and the county around homelessness has not been a very uh, happy one. And the fact that we are collaborating so closely uh, today and over the past two years is at the heart of the progress that we've made. Our plan addresses all homeless populations, chronically homeless adults, other single adults, veterans, youth, and families with minor children. And it does so in a comprehensive manner, from prevention to subsidized housing, to increased employment, case management and services, coordinating, creating a coordinated system, and increasing the supply of affordable and homeless housing. At the heart of the plan are the core elements of the homeless service delivery system. Street outreach, crisis housing, shelter and bridge housing, and permanent housing, rapid rehousing for adults who have a very good chance of regaining the ability to pay their own rent, typically for employment, with six to 12 months of uh, subsidized rent and intensive services, and permanent supportive housing for long-term disabled adults who are disabled and will need long-term services and a long-term rental subsidy. But our strategy is not limited to these four elements. It includes many, many other important items that are fundamental to this effort. An effort to file 10,000 disability applications per year, starting this fiscal year, for disabled homeless adults. Most, in most cases, that supplemental security income for veterans and veterans disability benefits. We have a series of employment programs involving the workforce development system to help the majority of homeless adults who have the ability to work and, get, and pay their rent through their wages, just like most of us in this room do. Uh, we have groundbreaking prevention initiatives for both single adults uh, and families. A, a series of strategies that focus on the justice involved in this population. Jail inreach for people while they are in a county jail to try to prevent them from being released into homelessness. And a range of services to help people who have exited jails or prisons to reintegrate and avoid or exit homelessness. This comprehensive strategy is supported through Measure H, the one quarter cent special sales tax approved by more than 69% of Los Angeles County voters this past March, which will generate $355 million a year for 10 years. It's actually in fact on October 1st, the beginning of this month. And our target is to enable 45,000 families and adults to exit homelessness into permanent housing during the first five years and enable an additional 30,000 families and adults to avoid becoming homeless during that same five year period. Now, let me say a word about collaboration. This plan in its development and implementation is the result and ongoing manifestation of an extraordinary collaboration between the county, cities, homeless service providers, philanthropy, the business community, and faith organizations. That collaboration has been manifest from the very beginning of the Homeless Initiative in August 2015, 400 different people, experts from across those sectors, including almost everybody in the front of the room today, participated in a series of policy summits to generate the strategy submitted to the Board of Supervisors, and that same process undergirds the Los Angeles City comprehensive from the strategy. That same collaboration has continued moving. As I've been saying, we did not create a blueprint which we are for a building that we are now constructing. 
We conceived and gave birth to a child together. A child who is now two years old that we continue to nurture every day and every week and every month. And as every parent in the room knows, nurturing a young child is a source of wonder, amazement, hope, exhaustion, frustration, and beleaguerment. And this issue is all of that, this effort, this countywide movement to combat homelessness is all of that and more. Let me close with a, a metaphor from the Buddha who said that a single candle can light a thousand others without diminishing itself. We are in the midst of an extraordinary countywide movement to combat homelessness where thousands of individuals and organizations, those employed in combating homelessness, and those who have other jobs and in other aspects of their life are involved in combating homelessness. We are lighting each other's candles, bringing more and more people in every day. Today we see a level of engagement from cities and faith organizations in combating homelessness that is unprecedented. 47 cities have applied for county funding to develop unprecedented city-specific plans to combat homelessness. That's just one example of this movement. Thank you. Yeah. And unless you, would you like to add, I have, um, I'm loving all these questions you're passing for. Um, so I'm gonna try to parse them out. But panelists, would you like to add to those remarks? Okay, here I'm going to ask some questions and anybody can jump in. What is the timeline for all of these projects? When will units be delivered and how many at what point? When will mobile bathrooms and showers be on the streets um, uh, providing services? So I'll speak sort of overall and then defer to Lisa on a couple of elements that were specifically addressed in the question. So we're, we're fortunate that the board approved, board of supervisors approved the, these comprehensive strategies to combat homelessness in February 2016. Because in the course of this year, 16, 17, we were able to uh, initially implement virtually all of those strategies using $100 million in one time county funding approved by the Board of Supervisors. So with the approval of Measure H, we were able to immediately commence implementation and use of the Measure H funding in July. So there are things that are already happening on the street, and in the, such as the expansion of rapid rehousing slots, the increase in multidisciplinary housing schemes, the extension of landlord incentives to um, get landlords to accept federal subsidies for people who need permanent supportive housing. All of the things I just mentioned have already happened, started happening July 1st, even though the measure eight sales tax didn't effect, take effect until October 1st. And over the course of this fiscal year, we will fully implement the utilization of Measure H across the 21 specific strategies approved by the Board of Supervisors for Measure H funding. I'll defer to Elisa specifically on the question around mobile showers and uh, construction. So under Prop HHH, which is the city housing bond, and thank you for Angelinos who uh, voted and supported that almost a year ago, last November. The first projects break ground, so around 615 units were approved for year one, around 400 plus are permit supported housing units, and again, that's an affordable housing unit with a long-term subsidy that also includes supportive services for the lifetime of that unit. Um, and those are breaking ground, actually some broke ground at the beginning of this month. The development cycle is a little long, but we tend to shorten it, so over the next two years, those just start opening. But please know there was a pipeline of projects that prior to HHAs that were already in line, and those were actually starting to do the ribbon cuttings. There's about two coming up in South LA over the next three weeks. Regarding mobile showers, uh, our first mobile shower program launched over five years ago in the San Fernando Valley. That's sponsored by San Fernando Rescue Mission. Lava Bay, thanks to Councilmember Bonnet, uh, came down to the Los Angeles area in November of last year. They're now in Skid Row, Venice, City Hall, and South LA. And one of the issues is capacity. So we're really desperately looking for vendors and social entrepreneurs to step up to do this. We have the model, Lava Bay has said they've reached capacity in the LA market, but they want to switch over to technical assistance. 
So again, if your organization or faith-based organization wants to get involved, we have the toolkit to help you. We just need to build that capacity. And funding is available. I just want to um, say something about uh, the timing of all this and solutions and, and addressing the understandable question that I've heard a lot of, like, well, that age, age is passed in November and age passed in March and uh, there's still a lot of homeless people on the street. Why has that been solved yet? Um, and you laugh, that's a good question a lot of people have and maybe some people have this room and I might have if I wasn't as close to it as, but these, Lisa and, and Phil are implementing things really quickly and making it sound amazing, and it is, but the problem is decades, some would say centuries in the making. It isn't a homelessness problem like the homeless services providers need to fix it. They are trying to undo years of things that we as a society, as a community, have created. This is an outcome, a rational outcome of our policies on housing, on mental health care, on drug treatment, and they are trying to Piece by piece, dismantle that wall to get people into housing. This is going to take a while, and we and the inflow has not stopped. As Senator Bloom was saying, we don't have enough affordable housing, and people are going to continue to be pushed out. So this is going to take a while, and they're moving incredibly fast. But let's keep the whole context in mind when we, before we get impatient. Sure. So um, I have a couple questions to answer the, the first is: Has enough money been allocated? In for people who cannot pay their rent, such as the prevention strategies A1 and A5 and affordable housing. So I would say in general, um, there's not enough money allocated for any element of the system, because even though $355 million seems like a lot of money, uh, it's not enough to do everything that's needed. So when the 50-member stakeholder process came together between March and May at the direction of the Board of Supervisors and reached a consensus on recommendations on how to spend a billion dollars in Measure H funding over the first three years. We looked at how to move things forward in parallel. In other words, increasing the number of shelter beds in parallel to increasing rapid rate housing and permanent supportive housing. Because it doesn't make sense to spend this much money on shelter and have people locked up in shelter and not able to get into permanent housing. So we need to grow the various elements of the system together. With respect to this, and, our, and our plan in the allocation of major resources is designed exactly to do that. And as I mentioned, we're rearing a child here, so we're learning every day from what's happening and making adjustments and changes and annual decisions on how to allocate the measure age funding. On the specific question about people who don't have enough money to pay the rent, I think there's two parts. For people who are already homeless, I think the answer is kind of provisionally yes, that within the constraints of the resources we have, I do think that we are allocating an appropriate amount to rapid rehousing to help people gain the ability to repay their own rent, but typically for employment, as I mentioned. Now, on the prevention side, for people who are precariously housed, one paycheck or even less away from becoming homeless, I think the answer is no. We've allocated a modest amount of funding for prevention for families and adults. And we'll learn from that, and I think over time we will increase that funding. But I want to be really clear on this point. The homeless services system by itself, even with the funding for Measure H, will not be able to meaningfully stem the overall flow of families and adults in their homelessness. There are certain populations, for example, people being released from jails and hospitals and foster care, where we have the ability to really reduce that flow because we know who they are, we have the direct connection. But for the much broader universe of people who are falling into homelessness every day, every week, and every month across Los Angeles County, primarily because they're unable to pay the rent, we can't solve that problem. The only solution to that problem is to increase the supply of housing. Homeless housing, affordable housing, and market rate housing. Because in an economy where the housing is allocated on a market basis driven by supply and demand, if we don't increase the supply, rents are gonna keep going up. And we could succeed in our goals with Measure H of moving 45,000 
homeless families and adults out in permanent housing and it, uh, helping 30,000 more avoid homelessness. And we could be sitting here five years from now with a bigger homeless count. A bigger homeless count despite that success. And if that's the case, it's because of this issue of inflow, of people continuing to become homeless. And the only way to get at that is to moderate increases in rents. The second um, question is about, uh, from the healthcare provider, about patients where it's difficult to place them into housing and the complexity of navigating the system. I'll say two points there. For hospitals in particular, we, the Department of Health Services will be rolling out either next month or the following, a centralized mechanism for hospitals to refer patients who they are discharging into what's called recuperative care, which is high-end crisis housing with fairly intensive health services for people who no longer need to be in a hospital. More generally, we have a coordinated entry system which matches my metaphor of nurturing a young child. Our coordinated entry system is the centralized infrastructure for assessing and matching homeless families, youth, and adults to crisis housing and permanent housing based on their need. It is a relatively new system. We are investing major age funding to make it better and stronger. And generally, the way to get people into housing is through the coordinated entry system where there are lead agencies funded by the law set in each of the eight geographic service planning areas in the county. Thank you, Phil. We're going to move on to a word we've heard, I think, a hundred times already, which is housing. So if you think about it, somebody is homeless. We try to help somebody before they're homeless not be homeless. But once they're homeless, and we're trying to ultimately get them into housing. And then once they're in housing, we're trying to not have them be warehoused, but rather thrive and, um, and, and get out of chronic poverty and the cycle of homelessness. So next is Carrie Morrison, who's going to discuss housing. And, and it's complicated, but it's critical. Thank you, Jill. I want to be a little bit provocative because I, you know, close oh. Okay. I'm going to be a little bit provocative. Um, the voters, you know, by more than was necessary last November, approved uh, Triple H. We needed a two thirds vote. I think we got about 77%. And my theory on, in public policy is we almost have to wait for a crisis to happen for people to ultimately move. So all this wonderful collaboration that Phil was referencing, and it is miraculous the way the city and county are coming together, and the package of bills that the assembly member um, mentioned, we have a heroic effort in Sacramento now to finally address the need for affordable housing and the need for communities all throughout the city to accept their fair share of affordable housing in their communities. We, we had to reach the state of crisis for people to move. So yes, I'm on the Triple H Citizens Oversight Committee, and I'll get questions even from my property owners in Hollywood. Well, this thing passed a year ago. Where the hell is the housing? You know, it's going to be 10,000 units built in 10 years. Well, as Elisa mentioned, there's a pipeline that, that was already kind of waiting. So the first $87 million out of that $1.2 billion bond issue was released. But now we have to find sites for the housing. We have to find places to build it. So let me ask the question, all of you wonderful, good people here, if the email offered their parking lot across the street here, where most of us parked here today, to build 120 units of permanent supportive housing for formerly homeless people, would we all be at the public hearing to support that? Um, it said something to the effect that LA has the money now, but the bigger problem is the community support for the housing. So there's a project in Boyle Heights that they've been working on for years. A very reputable, uh, affordable housing developer uh, to build permanent supportive housing, and it has run up against some opposition. I don't know all the details of it, but the, the thing is, we are never going to make that 10,000 goal. I mean, essentially we should be building at 1,000 a year. Uh, we're looking at, you know, the, the 
400 uh, right now in the pipeline. The RFP uh, is we're, we're accepting applications in November for the next round. Uh, but we need to like front load this. We need to be building two or three thousand in the early years. We don't want to wait until nine years from now. So again, I, I challenge this community. Let's say you did not support the email um, parking lot with permanent supportive housing. Let's just build high density market rate housing. Talking about relieving the pressure on our, our, our housing market in Los Angeles. We see um, high density apartments coming up against a buzzsaw of community opposition. Los Angeles is in this kind of cross crossroads of its old 20th century single family home sprawl versus a reluctance to embrace the 21st century urban city we are becoming. And we are going to not only lose our young people, including my own daughter who can't afford an apartment, um, but we are also going to see our homeless crisis worsen. So I know we don't have a lot of time to talk today, but I've got a bunch of ideas for people who want to make a meaningful impact. We had a church come into Hollywood recently and they started feeding people on Ibar. They thought that was the way to help the homeless. And we sat down with them and said, please, this is not helping. We need those people to come out to public hearings to support the 10,000 units that we need to build. And we don't want to wait 10 years. Let's try to do it in the next three. Other panelists, would you like to uh, voice them? Otherwise, I have a few uh, questions. So one question, we can see this. I live in West LA and I see more and more homeless in my neighborhood each week. Any reasons that's increasing here? Um, I grew up in Brentwood and um, uh, there were years and years of um, um, opposition to uh, multifamily housing apartments in my neighborhood uh, against the train coming through. Um, uh, no shelters, just battles right now is um, on the west side fighting shelter, being located by the property storage. Um, it's been so long of saying no, 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 no. And now that rents are going up and the very few affordable units left, are, are, there's pressure on people being pushed out, so they're out on the street, they have nowhere to go. This is a logical result of not having done anything for years and years and years. There's no facilities on the west side, so there's no place for
few different things. The, the Housing Authority of the County of Los Angeles recently conformed its criminal background requirements to match the mid, match what the federal government requires, which eliminated some locally imposed barriers that prevented people with a criminal background from accessing uh, federally subsidized or public housing. The, secondly, the um, governor recently signed AB 210, which was developed and sponsored by Los Angeles County as part of the homeless initiative, unanimously approved by both houses of the legislature. And then AB 210 permits counties to establish multidisciplinary homeless service teams where the members of the teams are permitted to share otherwise confidential information among themselves, which is intended to facilitate services for people experiencing homelessness, and that will help address the uh, issue of documentation that was addressed in the question. And then finally, uh, we have a policy in Los Angeles County that our crisis housing should be low barrier so that uh, for example, there should not be a requirement of sobriety, or there should not be a requirement of active mental health treatment uh, as a condition for a person to have access to shelter. Thank you, Phil. Um, Mr. An example, a shining star example of housing and housing for homeless is a new development that's uh, being that is being built by a community of friends in conjunction with St. Anne's. It's not far from here, it's on Beverly, um, east of Vermont. It's called Beverly Terrace. And we have to, with us today, Veronica, who, who's the director of housing there, vice president of housing, and she's going to discuss, um, this is a project that went through all of this stuff and got community support and got it built and they're just about to open for 39 families. <coughs>
this is why we decided to implement our services, our supportive services model into permanent supportive housing so that Jessica can continue on this amazing trajectory. As Jill mentioned, we are so very thrilled to offer Beverly Terrace a permanent supportive housing resource to our community. Uh, Beverly Terrace will be located on just four blocks from our main campus on the corner of Commonwealth and Beverly. Um, it will have 39 one and two bedroom apartment units for families who are at risk for homelessness, homeless families, and families who have experienced chronic homelessness. This beautiful new building will be LEED Platinum Certified, uh, which ensures the highest level of energy, water, and indoor environmental quality. Beverly Terrace will ensure that families like Jessica have a safe and, and affordable place to live with on-site free early childhood education and intensive case management services as well as all of the other services that Jessica has at St. Anne's. In addition to the services that St. Anne's will offer, we are so very excited to engage our community partners like Imagine LA in uh, working with us to build brighter futures for families like Jessica's. In partnering with Imagine LA, we're hoping to match all of our Beverly Terrace families with mentors that can support our families in achieving their goals and um, moving to uh, long-term success. This is where you all come in. <laughs> we need uh, volunteer mentors just like you all to work with our families and work closely with us in helping families like Jessica thrive. Together, we truly can make a difference, uh, one person at a time, one family at a time. If anyone is interested in volunteering, I welcome you to join us in our efforts to build brighter futures for all of our families. Uh, one at a time. Thank you so much. See, there's some bright lights, right? And if you didn't know, that beautiful red ring, that building that is to our, uh, on the, the, that is Beverly Terrace. Now let's take Carrie's challenge question again. Would you put that? in the Edel parking lot. <laughs> Panelists, do you have some questions? Yeah. Uh, have some comments. I think I have received about a hundred questions up here. <laughs> so, um, we're going to do our best to answer them in the time allotted. We have promised that this will end at, at 10 o'clock. But uh, a lot of them ask the question of how can I get involved? How can I be part of the solution? And we have an expert on that right here. As we said, last but not least, <laughs> Alisa, take it away. All right, thank you. Thank you for the invitation today and this great discussion. To be able to have this form because I think so often so much is happening and we all assume everyone knows the hard work we don't do the best job of communicating so we really appreciate the opportunity to come out so I'm going to try to rush through my notes but try not to forget anything so just going to read and glance up I think as you heard the heard the collaboration you heard the movement forward but you also heard that we still must move urgently because there are people on our streets today just a few examples. Last Saturday, I received a text early in the morning from one of Carrie's colleagues, another business improvement district, that talked about a woman who was just raped, and they were waiting for LAPD and EMS to arrive. When I go back to City Hall today, I have to help the outreach team find an elderly African-American woman who's 84 years of age, find, find her so that we can get her reconnected back to housing. She was housed in a motel, but because of the trauma and broken promises in her life, she left thinking we were too nice and didn't understand what was happening. On my desk, I have a phone message from Mr. Barry, an elderly man who has been in and out of our prison system. He was recently re released into a temporary home, but he has two weeks to find a permanent home that he can afford or he'll be back out in a tent. And then finally, there's Natalie. We met her last year with Carrie at the Center for Blessed Sacrament, not too far from here. 
She has experienced chronic homelessness and lives with mental illness. It took a village to house her, but more importantly, it's going to take a village to keep her housed. So far, that village has come through, and she's been housed for over a year, the longest time that she's been stably housed in her life. These are real stories, but these are only the stories that I'm directly involved in. Each of you have your own story. If it's a family member, someone that you work with, our librarians, our police officers, our EMS, there's so many people out there on the front lines of homelessness, and we need all of you to get involved. Last January, thousands of us showed up downtown in protest for democracy and a threat that we thought would change. Will you stand up in the fight of injustice and homelessness in solidarity the same way? The nation recently has risen up in indignation against the atrocity of Hollywood's great culture that lie within the shadow of its glitz. While we're outraged, are we still outraged for the woman who was raped last weekend, the one last night in Skin Row, and the hundreds of others experiencing homelessness that also cry out, me too. When the Indigo opened in downtown LA not too long ago, hundreds lined up to take a tour of its facility. How many of us are lining up to tour the local permanent supportive housing projects such as this in our own community? We must stop paying lip service to liberal idealism, a vision of building a world of tolerance and equity. We are overdue in putting these thoughts into practice. We can no longer be bystanders, we must be active witnesses. So will you join me today? Will you answer the mayor's call to join Days of Compassion? Will you commit today to one of the ideas listed on the back of your program booklet? Will you say yes, as the call was just made, to mentoring a recently housed person or family by signing up with Imagine LA? Will you say yes to walking against homelessness in United Way's upcoming home walk on November 18? Will you say yes to talking about homelessness by hosting a welcome home uh, party in your home and donating welcome home baskets to your local coordinated entry system provider? Will you say yes to hosting a holiday meal in your own backyard, not just Skid Row? Don't bypass people in our own communities to move to Skid Row. Will you say yes to safe parking? the first place of safety for a family fleeing domestic violence or the working poor so they can have a safe place to sleep? Will you say yes to an after-hours cafe to provide respite for vulnerable homeless residents such as our transgender community, youth, and the elderly? A safe place through the hours of 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. for coffee, showers, and conversation. Will you say yes to erecting a personal hygiene station, to hiring someone that comes through one of those programs, to housing opportunities in your community, particularly landlords accepting a Section 8 voucher or rapid rehousing subsidy, or of course, yes to permit supportive housing, and yes to call upon your council person to support the linkage fee. And will you say yes to know a neighbor experiencing homelessness near you to make sure they're aware of the resources available today? What do you stand for? What do we stand for? What will we say yes to, and what will we risk to join this fight against homelessness? Yeah. That was fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, we are going to do our best to answer as many of the questions that you have um, submitted to us in the next 15 minutes. Um, before we go directly into those questions, um, uh, I want to ask our panelists if they, if each of them might have a few last words. Anyone? I would just say, I hope that anything that you take away today, while homelessness seems insurmountable, we can approach this issue step by step. And part of it is just joining together, knowing that you doing a little something different than when you first walked in, it would make a difference. Maybe it's saying hello, making eye contact. Maybe it's going to take a tour of a local facility. Get involved, get educated, and then bring a friend along. I would just like to echo those, I would like to echo those comments and um, just really invite everybody to do whatever they can, even if it's sharing the link to this panel, um, educating others about what you learned today. Um, it, it really takes a village, and uh, we're not. Nobody's going to solve this problem on their own. Yeah, you know, um, it was about 2005 in Hollywood. I was afraid to talk to homeless people. I was afraid, 
And um, I just started to confront that fear. And you've heard such great stories that Jessica and I think Greg mentioned. Everybody out there has a unique road into that place. So I conquered that fear by talking to people. Talk to the safest person first, right? Don't go to the guy who's freaking everybody out on the bus bench. Um, but I guarantee you, if you follow Elisa's advice to do one thing different even today, the ripple effect coming out of this room will be profound. When we started the homeless initiative 26 months ago, there was a pervasive sense of despair across Los Angeles County that homelessness was so intractable that no matter how much we tried and no matter what resources we committed, it wouldn't make any difference. And that sense of despair existed at all levels, from homeless service providers who had spent their lives working on homelessness, to elected officials, to residents, to businesses. And over the last two years, that pervasive sense of despair has given way to a widespread sense of hope. Notwithstanding the fact that conditions on the ground have gotten worse. When LA City voters supported measure triple or proposition Triple H in November, and then remarkably in a low turnout countywide off year election, over two thirds of countywide voters supported Measure H, they expressed that sense of hope. Because people don't take collective action only because things are terrible. People take collective action because they have hope, because they, because we believe that it is possible to make a difference. And the voter support for H and Triple H concretely reflected that. So as, as we all go forth from today, from this gathering today, whatever our individual role is in preventing and combating homelessness, I want to encourage us to continue to build on that sense of hope and to light each other's candles and to discover and implement ways to prevent and combat homelessness. Because there are as many ways to contribute as there are people in this room and as there are residents across Los Angeles County. And as we allow our minds and our hearts to come together, and be moved by the underlying passion and compassion that every human being who sees someone on the street feels, collectively can we can move this, well, this movement forward. There's a unique thing about homelessness, which is that everyone cares about it, and no one is for it. Everyone cares about it, and no one is for it. There's not one person, regardless of their politics, regardless of where they live, regardless of their income, regardless of their age, regardless of their ethnicity. There's not one person in Los Angeles County who walks by someone sleeping on the sidewalk and says, I'm really happy about that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think uh, if you and um, I'm just uh, address any of the questions that you have in front of you. One thing I just want to mention is we see a person on, on the street and we want to help them. What do we do to help them? Who here knows about 211? Lisa, would you like to? Describe 211 and how we use it. Absolutely. So, there are a couple. 211 is a countywide system, and Phil will, will correct me if I misspeak, but you can call and ask for a variety of social services. It's like a non emergency line, but if you know someone experiencing homelessness looking for shelter, even if you don't have a question about utilities or something, you can call 211. And through the homeless service system, you'll get connected to your local, what we call, coordinated entry system. And I didn't 
think to bring them. Um, but we actually created this card because the coordinated injury system is broken down by region. So if you're in Hollywood or San Pedro or in the Valley, to do a direct line to who your local coordinated injury provider is. Right now, you can definitely go on the LASA website, and that's www.lahsa.org, and look for your local coordinated entry. But these cards are good. A lot of times people ask, someone asked me for money, I wasn't comfortable, what should I do? Hand them a card. And another card that we created is around mental illness. Oftentimes people don't know what to do. They see someone walking in traffic. They see someone walking down the street naked. Or they may see someone even a little bit more violent. So we created this card again with um, the countywide emergency or numbers for uh, mental illness, but also LAPD if you do have to call a process of how you should call and the kind of information that you should uh, offer. Yeah, Great point. Okay. My last Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health is 1-800-854-7771. Again, 1-800-854-7771. If you're a family member or someone in your um, family you know, has issues with mental illness and you don't know what to do, you can also call the National Alliance of Mental Illness, 1-800-950-6264. One eight hundred nine five zero six two six four, and then of course two one one. Ways to stay informed. We had great uh, Councilman Rue has a fantastic newsletter, the e newsletter, and you can uh, email them, or I think even sign up at, uh, on a list outside on the table, um, where you can receive that email. From him that updates you on what's happening and what you do around homelessness here in our community. There's also many other ways like the Greater Wilshire Neighborhood Council that actually meets here at the EBEL. That you can get involved, you can show up for meetings, you can get on their list. It's important to get engaged with people in our community and stay informed. I also wanted to mention we are here at the EVEL. The EVEL has a wonderful nonprofit organization within it called the Rest Cottage. And it funds organizations that help homeless women um, and around homeless issues, places like the Alexandria House, like St. Anne's, and so forth. And we are actively involved, so you as EVEL members or potential EVEL members can get involved directly with issues affecting women's homelessness uh, by being involved here at the EVAL. Uh, I think we're just about to wrap it up. We have so many questions and I don't want to, uh, to play favorites. Does anybody have any burning things that they would like to answer right now before we have five minutes? Go ahead. To this neighborhood, the question is Will allowing homeowners to remodel garages and living units make an impact on housing at any level? I would say yes. If you want to create a second unit, a granny flat, whatever you want to call it, that adds um, supply to the market. There were many questions around it, and a lot of great suggestions around how can we build housing faster? Can we convert hotel rooms? Can we do, you know, convert different things and not just build from scratch? And the answer is yes, and the answer I believe, and unless my panelists tell me differently, we're trying everything. Absolutely everything. <laughs> is there anything anybody would like to say specifically about that? Well, I just want to add on, on Carrie's point that, that accessory dwelling units are an excellent way to increase the supply of housing, and most accessory dwelling units will be affordable. If commonly known as granny flat, Every homeowner in Los Angeles County has an entitlement to, if they meet a series of fairly limited restrictions, to add a second unit in their backyard, uh, in an R1 unit, in an R1, in a property that's zoned R1, there's this authority under state law to add a unit. And recent changes in state law uh, made it easier to do that. So I think that this is a strategy that has a great deal of potential to uh, 
among the many other strategies to address this shortage in affordable housing. May I help? Uh, so that was my legislation last year.